Welcome back to these Bible Talks. I'm glad you're joining us. I'm speaking on the subject of bad boys, and I'm taking it from the text of the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15 about a father who had two sons who disappointed him. It's the younger son that we're talking about at the moment, and uh, this is the fourth in our series of considerations about these two bad boys. And today, I want to speak to you about the bad decisions that um, this younger son made and asked the question, why did he make decisions like this? Here's my text from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. And this is what it says. It says in verse 13, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey to a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Now the question I want to ask is this, why do people make such bad decisions? Now we've looked at this young son, and uh, we looked at his rebellion against his father, we looked at the fact that he took his father's money, and now we are faced with the fact in the story that Jesus told, and remember this story would have been a shocking story to the people who were listening to Jesus, who would have gone right against their own culture for anything like this to happen. But Jesus tells this story so that he can draw out heavenly meanings, spiritual meanings, and help people to see themselves in what he was saying. And so the question is, why would a young man who had everything like this young man had, why would he take it all and go and make all of these bad decisions that destroyed his life? Just look at the series of bad decisions that he makes, according to the story in Luke chapter 15. First of all, he rejected his father the great final authority in his life. He was saying to his father, I don't want to live under your authority at all. I want to be my own man. Secondly, he took all of his money and then he squandered it, threw it all away, wasted it all. And then it tells us that he decided to live recklessly. He had no sense of forethought at all. He lived wastefully. And all that he received from his father just dribbled through his fingers and disappeared. So consequently, there was no provision for the future. And the future came upon him as it will come upon you and upon me. And when the future came, he had nothing at all. And then he did the unthinkable for a Jewish boy. And the Jewish people listening to this would have been terribly shocked. He took a job looking after pigs. And so he went down to the very bottom of his cultural pit, very bottom of his hole. And that's where he was because of his bad decisions. So the question is, why did he take this route? And why do people think like this? Why do people make this kind of bad decision? You may know people like that. Maybe you've made bad decisions in your life or you've got people or family members in your own circle who have made these bad decisions and you've looked on shaking your head as you've seen them make one bad decision, one bad judgment after the other, And destroy themselves. Why do people live like that? And the first thing I want to say is that we've got to remember that in all decision making in life, there lies a world view. And uh, the first thing I want you to remember is that we who are Christians have a Christian world view which is different to the world view of those who are not Christian people. It's radically different because the Christian world view says that there are two ways to live. And the first way of living, the right way of living, is to remember that the universe has a creator. He is the king of all that he has created. He is the almighty God. And that he is the king of his entire universe and he sent his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to the cross on this earth so that we might be reconciled to him and live under his rule. And for those who live under the rule of the king of the universe, life is drastically different to those who don't. It doesn't mean that we escape all the problems and difficulties of living in this world, but we live under the rule of a king. We have new instincts, new desires, and we've got a new power within us which enables us to live differently to many of the people in the world today. The second way of living is to make yourself the king of your own life, and that's what many people do. They reject the king of the universe and say, I'm going to be king of my own life. And so, in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 2, it says this, A fool 
does not delight in understanding. In other words, it doesn't delight in being taught or instructed or helped or given advice in any way. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. He only wants what he wants. He wants to tell you what he thinks and what he wants or she wants or what she thinks. That's what they want to tell you. And there's no thought at all that there's other wisdom. There's an accumulation of wisdom over the years that could help them because history is not important. And uh, there's a new world out there and there's a new system out there and I want to be part of that and I want to be my own person. So the first thing to remember is that there's a Christian view of living and there's a non-Christian view of living. And you've got to remember that when you think about people and the things that they do with their lives. The second thing I want to point out to you is that the thing that controls people today is the desire for personal autonomy. We've discussed this before and I raise it with you again. The desire for personal autonomy is very powerful. The desire to be our own selves, to be authentic people, because this is what our society, our younger people especially, are being taught today in various ways, is that to be authentic, you've got to be yourself. And uh, so if you, if you want to be yourself, you've got to go out there and make your own decisions. You've got to be what you are inside. Well, what happened to this young man in the story was that he became rootless when he left his father's house. He left his foundations behind. He listened to the opinion of society. And he became a slave to what other people think and what other people do. And he did what many people do. He sought for happiness because many people believe today that the only thing that really matters is what makes me happy. People think like that. They even get divorces on the basis that their partners no longer make them happy and they aren't satisfied anymore. So there's no great rules or dynamics or principles guiding them. Purely their own sentiments and their own feelings that guide them and they go out into the world armed with only those things so that they can negotiate life and that's the only thing that they got. They feel they can't look to God because he doesn't exist and there's too much contradiction. When you talk about God, you can't look to history because history is obsolete. You've got to be on the right side of history to be able to make it in today's world and uh, so they look to themselves. That's what they do and they look to their deepest inner feelings And they want to be as authentic as they can. And the result is that many of them become rootless. There is no way of finding your way in the world unless you take into account the transcendental. But if the transcendental, that is God, that is the Almighty, if he doesn't exist, if there aren't transcendental purposes and rules in the world, you make up your own rules and your own rules depend on how you feel and how you feel may change from morning to morning when you wake up in the morning. You've got to bear that in mind about the people you know whose lives are being wasted. And then thirdly, I want you to remember another great, powerful dynamic that operates in people. I've mentioned already, and I mentioned again, and it's this, that their personal happiness becomes their new law. What makes them happy is the thing that guides them and uh, and that motivates them and propels them into the future. Now, this young man stood before his father, And we've considered already that his father was a man of great substance and benevolence and generosity and a man who cared about his children, cared about his people. And if he was the patriarch of the village, would have cared about the village. And all the things to give this young man meaning in life was there before him and he rejected it all because he believed the lie that his father could not make him happy. That's what people think about God today, that God doesn't exist in him. If he did, he wouldn't make me happy. He would stand in my way. He would, he, would, he would somehow block my way, he gets in the way of my happiness. And that, incidentally, is one of the reasons why so many people are so agitated when you talk to them about God, because any reference to God is a confrontation with their own personal little philosophies they've developed about themselves, and it speaks about someone greater to whom they're ultimately responsible, and they don't want to hear about it. No, no, they want what they makes them happy to be the guiding factor in their lives. So they'll tell you, I'm a good person. And um, I, I, my, my great aim in life is to be as sincere and as authentic as I can. But in the process, they become lawless in the sense that they have rejected all of the laws, all of the guiding principles of the past for what's going on in their own hearts and amongst the friends that they're mingling with in the popular culture at the time. 
and so they are entirely at the mercy of their own feelings and at the opinion of their own friends who are exerting their own opinions on the person concerned. And as long as you don't hurt, hurt anybody else, you can do as you please. You can do anything you want to, you can be as free as you want to, as long as you're authentic, you don't hurt anybody, and you be who you are. So many people are governed by feelings like that today in the search for happiness. Off goes this young man. He's got his money, he's got his freedom, and off he goes to seek his fortune in the world today. But I want to point out to you in the, th in the fourth place what his big mistake was. You see, everybody else that he met along the way, all the friends, friendships that he formed along the way, and I'm supposing that if this were a true story, well, it's the parable, remember, but if it were a true story, a young man like this with the kind of privileges he had would have traveled and made friends around the place wherever he traveled. I'm supposing he might have met people like that, but everybody he met and everybody who formed his social circle, they were also autonomous people. They were also seeking their own happiness. Now, if you seeking your happiness and I'm seeking my happiness, sooner or later, we're going to clash. If you are concerned only about yourself and I'm concerned only about myself, then sooner or later, we're going to clash because they felt no obligation to this young man when he had spent all his money on them and they disappeared because they had nothing more to offer them. Their happiness had been satisfied to a certain extent by him. Now... He's got no one left. And so he's left because he's left lonely and he's left isolated because everybody wants to be their own boss. They only want to live for themselves. Now this young man lived a reckless life according to the text that we have before us, a riotous life. And in other words, it doesn't necessarily mean that he needs to be immoral, but in this context, definitely he appears to have lived a totally reckless, uncaring life and in fact, he lived a wasteful life. He wasted his money. He didn't have any discernment. He had no forethought. And so he lived entirely for the moment. And as he lived for the moment, according to what his own heart dictated, so he wasted his resources until finally he wasted his life. And you know what I want to point out to you is this, is that the consequences of his autonomy was that he had a kind of a certain childishness, naivety about him. He, he, he acts without thinking. This is what it looks like. He loses discernment. Haven't you noticed that in people? They're not able to make out what's right and wrong. They lose the ability to discern. They're easily taken in by other people. And so this young man falls into that great trap. He listens to other people who are living only for themselves. And the result is that self-centeredness or narcissism dominates the day but he, he's got a desire for community that's why he's got to have friends around him but even so at the end of the day his desire for autonomy to rule his own life means he can't even keep his friends around him anymore and he ends up entirely alone because loyalty means nothing amongst those people and so he lands up in utter degradation makes me think of a of a quote by pg woodhouse i don't now remember where it comes from but you might remember the writings of P.G. Woodhouse, and he made this comment once, that life can be like a man who drinks a sweet cup of wine only to discover a dead beetle at the bottom. And that's what this boy did. He had drunk his life to the very bottom. At the end of it all was a dead beetle. In other words, it was all wasted. It was all for nothing. So he had nothing, he had no one, and he was in disgrace. So what a life, what a way to spend your life, what a way to make decisions, to reject everything of the past, to reject everybody's wisdom, to say that I am the epitome of wisdom for myself. You don't know me, I am the one who knows myself. You don't understand me, you know nothing about me, is what people say. You often see that on, on, your, on your television and on the movies today. When one person tries to talk to another, they'll say, you don't know me, you know nothing about me. In other words, I'm the one who understands myself and I am the controller of my own destiny. Well, so be it. Off you go and you make your own final consequence and you make your life a wreck. You do it your own way and go and be what you want to be without your father, without God, without any ruling principle in your life at all. 
Fifthly, I'd like you just to note something. And it's this. That self-autonomy, when you've got no guiding principle, when you've got no idea of a guiding force in this world, when there's no idea of a God who rules things, no sort of moral arch in the world from the beginning to the end, there's nothing, no way you fit in, only leads ultimately to disappointment. Because that is how everybody that you like will be themselves. They all disappoint you. Because everybody's living for themselves. There's no guiding principle. We live for the moment, take what we can, and once we've got what we, what we want, we're gone. And so, when you live for yourself, it will always lead to disappointment. And you'll see it in your friends, you'll see it in your family, you'll see it in your children, you'll see it at the people at work where you work. That when they live like this, when they live a reckless life like this, there's always a sense of disappointment, of betrayal. There's always a sense of looking for someone to meet that need. And there's that sense of having lost their lives in some way. And then I'd like you to note this, that the disappointment that these people experience, the disappointment of people who want to live entirely for themselves in our new cultures, in our new world, are very seldom reported on in the press. You don't read too much about their disappointments. You don't read too much about the things that are going on in their lives. You don't read too much about their own existential unhappiness that happens day to day. You don't read too much about the desperate scramble to keep their autonomy um, uh, in place and to keep their authenticity. You, you don't read too much about the desperate scramble to keep it there and the failure and the depression that comes upon them. And sometimes they'll end up with either suicide or in hospital. Not always, but very often. But we don't read too much about it because that is not what is given publicity today. But the final result of all of this kind of living is final humiliation and a kind of a spiritual poverty that comes upon people. And that is why the father let him go. It was a judgment upon him, you see. And here he is. Now he's facing the judgment. He's alone. He's by himself. He's in a disgraceful situation for uh, a man of his culture and of his age. He's got nothing. And he's lived his own life. He's been his own boss and has brought him down to the end. He's ruled himself into destruction. Don't you know people like that? I'm sure you do. Maybe you feel like that yourself. So this is where we leave the boy today. Is that where we leave him? Well, just for today. The story goes on, as you know. There is another dynamic at work that begins to work in his life. And those unseen dynamics are what we're going to be discussing about this boy. Does he stay in the big sty? Does he get out of it? And if he gets out of it, what are those powerful dynamics that bring him out of it? Well, of course, we know ultimately it's the Spirit of God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that helps us. But what helped this boy to get out of his pigsty? To hear that, you've got to join me next week. And I hope to see you then. Goodbye.